Uh, hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'll start with John Soltis at Hollywood Soapbox. Hi, thanks for the time today. Um, this is obviously a film that a lot of people know, certainly, and they love. What do you think the film still says to society, the world, the media industry here in uh, 2021? Uh, well, I mean, I think it says something about uh, certainly the uh, corporate control of, uh, of the media uh, the, 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 uh, and the dangers of, of uh, the dangers, certainly, of, uh, of, of misusing uh, the power that that uh, misusing them and trying to phrase it in a, in, a, in a moderately thoughtful way, but misusing the power that comes to that. I mean, obviously, we've had corporate control of media for some time, but if there's a, uh, you know, I always think about CBS News, right, where there was obviously no one would deny the power of the, the CBS Corporation and that they and and and, and, and but there was a hands-off approach, right? Where they left the news division alone. And then that began to change in the eighties. And now that's just sort of the acceptable model that we have. Um, uh, so it's a little bit different here because this is specifically the politics and the power of one man uh, uh, dictating uh, news coverage to millions and millions of Americans. Uh, it's a little bit uh, different now, though obviously there are some direct uh, uh, of parallels even with Charles Foster Kane now and, and media control. But in general, what we're looking at is just, a, you know, uh, uh, I mean, there, we're a corporatist uh, uh, society and a consumerist society, but some of that still applies uh, in Kane and that it is, uh, it is rare for uh, uh, independent free thinking in journalism to break through big picture, can break through daily in lots of little ways, but big picture, uh, you know, that's fighting them. A massive, uh, a, a massive uphill battle. And now, what we perceive as sort of bold, uh, independent breakthrough journalism is really just sort of, uh, you know, often anyway, uh, contrarian nonsense steeped in very little fact or information, and then standing on the broad shoulders of, "Hey, man, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just thinking for myself, right?" And I'm, you know, so we don't even know yet what is a what is real real independent journalism is so rare um that we don't even know it uh when we see it although again i, I don't want to because i'm a giant consumer of journalism and i love it and was in it for a long time i'm not knocking all these individual journalists who work for giant giant corporate entities they're out there busting their ass doing critically good work on a daily basis but overall uh, man, it is uh, it is uh, tough to break through a sort of a, a corporate uh, group think that pervades. I think every uh, pervades throughout uh, uh, the journalism most of us uh, uh, read on a daily basis. Hi Ben, this is Danny Miller. <clears throat> like so many people, I think Citizen Kane is really one of the greatest films ever made. Um, even more astonishing because of Orson Welles's age at the time. I was just wondering, growing up, like the lore this film had in your family, did you grow up watching it and being aware of your grandfather's involvement or did you come to appreciate that more later on? I definitely came to appreciate it more later on, but I did know. Um, but, you know, I grew up in D.C. and my, my father was a, uh, I mean, he was a fairly big deal in Democratic politics. And even Bobby Kennedy's press secretary ran George McGovern's campaign. That was all when I was very young. You know, Bobby died. Bobby was murdered when I was one and the McGovern campaign when I was five. Um, but, you know, my dad was constantly being, you know, I mean, like the answering, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I mean, the, you know, regular calls from, uh, from, from Ted Kennedy, uh, you know, regular calls from uh, Warren Beatty to talk politics always. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I barely knew Warren Beatty was a filmmaker. <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, and many others. And my dad was always the smartest person in any room he was in. And I, so I, I just thought there was this sort of Hollywood wing of the family, which my dad had sort of very consciously fled from. And I knew Herman had written the movie and I knew the family line that he had written the movie. He'd written the movie. Um, so, you know, until I was older, I sort of was like, oh, Wells is this guy who tried to steal credit for my grandfather's movie. And then and then I remember, you know, these memories 
I don't know how much I trust them, but I, uh, it's funny. I'm not even sure I've ever said this, but I, uh, the first time I saw it with some cognition of that it was important, I do remember thinking, okay, well, obviously this is very good and it's very clever. And it sounds like a Mankiewicz wrote it, but I mean, I'm pretty sure this Wells guy deserves a tremendous amount of credit, even if he didn't write a work <laughs> um, like this sort of, I was like, and then I thought, and I go back over it. I'm like, well, I don't think anybody ever said that he didn't deserve credit. They were just talking about the screenplay, but I didn't, you know, again, I, movies were not important to me. Uh, I mean, other than as a consumer of movies until I was, you know, really a little bit changed in college, but really into my, uh, into my, into my twenties. So, uh, um, and now I sort of feel like I can say, yeah, I think Herman really deserves the overwhelming lion's share of the credit for writing the screenplay, but let's not kid ourselves. That's Orson Welles' movie, period. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, as Salty at the Movies. This Hi, Ben. Uh, it's good to talk with you again. Hi, yeah. Nice. You too. This may be more of a hypothetical, but if Citizen Kane were to be made for the first time today, how different would it be from the film that came out in theaters? No, pretty sure it'd be in color. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, there would probably be... Uh, um, you know, the, the, like the 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 Spanish American War would probably be like the you know there'd be a the the event the manipulated news event would be bigger than the personal story, right? I mean, in 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 Kane, the 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 biggest manipulated news event is the criticism of Susan Alexander Kane's performance, right? Like, how's that handled? That's what breaks up the friendship. It's what ultimately tells you fully sort of what kind of man Charles Foster Kane is, or at least partly what kind of man he is. Nothing tells you completely these complicated nuts. So uh, I, I suspect it would be a little bit uh, uh, bigger. Uh, it, ha it would have a bigger worldview. Um, but, you know, I mean, it depends on who made it, right? Uh, as to what kind of movie it would be. And not just the director, but, uh, you know, who financed it, where the pressures were. You know, uh, but uh, it wouldn't be as good because it would be impossible. And I'm not knocking modern movies. There's some great modern movies and they've made a lot of movies better. But, you know, you got the poster there behind you. Nobody's nobody's making Citizen Kane better than Orson Welles. And nobody's making Casablanca better than Michael Curtis. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Mike at the Video Attic. Sorry. Hey, hi, Ben. Uh, thanks so much for um, uh, having me. Um, sure. So now I'm curious uh, what you th uh, thought of uh, movies like Mank and RKO uh, 281. You know, it's funny. I, 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 I don't know. It's like they, <laughs> so I haven't seen RKO 281 in 10, 12 years. And uh, uh, I watched it. Uh, I mean, I fell asleep through no fault of it. Don't, so don't write that. I mean, I, I was super <laughs> into it. I, fighting falling asleep it was very late at night um uh, a few nights ago um to th this weekend so we're talking here on monday it's friday night um and uh you know i love some of the changes made in that that had you know wells never met hearst but they're in rko 281 they have wells at you know at the castle and interacting with hearst and you know there was a time in my life i would have been like that didn't happen <laughs> um i actually yelled at precariously balanced uh, uh, here in the car. Um, and, uh, you know, now I think that's interesting. Like, you know, yeah, it doesn't matter, it's fine. You're allowed, it's fine, it's fine, settle down. Um, so uh, I, I like RKO 281 very much. I mean, my memory of it is that, yeah, I liked it because it made it seem like Herman wrote the screenplay. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, it's great. Uh, and I love Liev Schreiber and John Malcolm. So, uh, uh, you know, and not a lot of people saw it, but I thought it was great. I love almost any, uh, you know, ins a good inside Hollywood story. I totally forgot Melanie Griffith played Mary, right? You know, and it's just such a great cast. James Cromwell, and those are good people. Uh, uh, so I liked it. And then, you know, Mank, look, man, I started sobbing at the, the title card for crying out loud. I mean, it's, you know, it's called Mank. And they say Mank a hundred times, 112 times or something in the movie. And everybody, everybody in my family's called Mank. Um, 
So I thought Mank was really great. I just thought it was a wonderful, wonderful movie. I mean, I, I get it that, you know, probably didn't connect with everybody because it doesn't really build to anything. It's really just a slice of, slice of life of this struggling writer. All right. But, you know, I never met my grandfather and that that character that Fincher gave us and that, that Gary Oldman gave us of Herman is exactly how my father described him. You know, it's like my father talked to Fincher, which he didn't. You know, my dad died in 2014. Um, and so I just kept thinking, man, my dad would love this. You know, that Herman, smart, funny, yeah, drunk, gambler, reckless, filled with self-loathing. All those things were true, but he was never mean. You know, my dad regretted that he'd come home and, and fall asleep pass out so he missed time with him but you know he loved his father and, and and I think you know recognized that torture and that's why my dad didn't want to make movies who my dad would have been a brilliant screenwriter um but he uh you know he saw he felt like that that, that career you know drove his father to an early death and uh, my dad wanted to do something that was undeniably that he could be proud of even though now it's silly. Like you want, what I want to go back in time and tell my grandfather is, you know, uh, stop wallowing, you moron. Like what you're doing is valuable. <laughs> you know, this is great what you're doing. This is art. Uh, but you know, he didn't. Uh, he did not. He did not see it that way. So, um, so I love Mank, and I, I think RKO two eighty one is uh, is terrific too. And I can't wait to. Uh, I can't wait to finish it. My wife hasn't seen it, so I'm gonna. We're gonna start it over and. Uh, uh, and watch it together. She'll love it too. I did meet John Malkovich. It was very, you know, like this is I don't know, 15 years ago, something I'm making, maybe more 20, something like that. And I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm Ben Mankiewicz. You know, you never knew my grandfather, but you played him. And he was like, Oh, great. Nice to meet you. I was like, Oh, I, I guess that meant more to me than him. He was very nice, but, but I just, you forget that it's not like it doesn't really matter. He played a lot of people. Um, so anyway, I think they're both, um, you know, I think they're both, they're both really, really valuable. But I'm a sucker for those kind of movies, even if they, uh, even if they don't have uh, a relative of mine in it. Okay, thanks. Thank sure. you. Uh, Kimberly at Journeys in Classic Film. Thank you so much for the time. I just wanted to go back on your first experience with watching Citizen Kane, that first time watch, it can be such, it's such a brilliant, but can be such a complicated movie. And I was just wanted you to hear you reflect some on your thoughts, your feelings when you watch that for the first time. Well, like I said, I, I, I have all these different, you know, I've seen it, I don't know, you know, I've seen it 30 times now, maybe 50, maybe 21. I don't have any idea. So, and certainly parts of it. Uh, I mean, I've watched the newsreel probably that's probably 50 times right um i love um i love newsreels to begin with so uh, you know i i do remember that sense that 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 i had misinterpreted what my dad had said that you know sort of my idea of telling people you know i just remember as a kid a long time telling people my grandfather wrote it not not always well but just you know like like that that meant like it was a book Right. And somebody had still stolen off. And then I do remember seeing it and thinking, oh, well, I think that this Wells guy deserved maybe, maybe I shouldn't dismiss this, <laughs> this character. And then I, I, the only time what I, I, I saw it at college at Tufts. Um, and, uh, and we, uh, like it, it, they, it was, you know, I, I don't know, Saturday night movies and one of the, you know, regular movies at the school when I, I didn't go to many. I saw Midnight Run at Tufts too. That was also a great experience. And I saw Kane and I saw them I, like maybe in back-to-back -back weeks because I, the experience of seeing one was so good that I went back the, the next week. And again, movies were not terribly important to me and, and or not as important as they should have been considering the job I have until I, until I really got out of college into my, into my twenties. And, um, but when I saw it at, uh, at, at Tufts, Th that was profound. I remember feeling emotional about it and, and have being in a, uh, in a theater wh where all these other kids were reacting to it in a, in a strong way. And I did feel this sort of enormous sense of pride uh, in it because you're like, this is just so cleverly structured, right? Um, and I'm still to this day far more likely uh, to pay attention to the, uh, you know, to the, the structure of the script and to what people say to each other than I am to appreciate, you know, depth of field. Um, so, and, and certainly that was the case at that, at that point. So I, 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 I felt a, a, an enormous sense of pride that somebody in my family, this clever had written that. And then 
echoing what I've has been a you know a, a burden that um you know that I'm lucky to carry right but this sense of oh crap you know my dad was so smart and and so thoughtful and everybody wanted his opinion and solicited his opinion and then I'm watching this college and thinking oh I see where he, why he's clever right this is more this is smarter than I recognized I am never ever 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 going to come close to matching this and you know <laughs> is it too late to go by my middle name call myself Benjamin Fredericks you know um uh and you know that I've again you know wrestled with uh, for a long time but you know that's the nature of having this name which is uh in in general of course is you know opened far more doors than than the than the difficulty of of carrying that sense that you'll never match your your ancestors but you know that's what a lot of kids feel so uh the, that experience of seeing it at tufts was the first one that that mattered uh, i had seen it before um but uh that's the one that uh, that's the one that mattered and and it you know that's where i took my first film course too and to a film course pass fail and then wrote a paper on the Santa Fe Trail, the Warner Brothers picture that sort of, you know, about where John Brown is Hitler and and that puts all these generals that, that you know, did gone to West Point together and then, but a different, had gone to West Point, but not together and puts them together in this pursuit of uh, uh, John Brown. And I wrote a paper on it. Again, I took the course pass fail. I didn't even try it. I got, it's the only A plus I've ever got, A plus on a paper. And, uh, and I thought, and you know, I instantly thought, I can't believe I took this course past fail. It's the dumbest, dumbest decision I've, I've ever made. But I, I still look at that as a moment where I was like, oh, maybe this is, maybe this is something I can talk about. Maybe this is something that, that they're the interesting. I don't know whether anybody else would find what I said interesting, but the fact that I, I did so well on a paper that I, I had no expectation for caring about, um, uh, uh, that mattered. So uh, this, this, things began to change for me there at, uh, at college. And I suspect that that viewing of, of Kane uh, mattered somewhat too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Koku at Black Film. Hi, Ben. My name is Koku with BlackFilm.com. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest, I am one of those people that is late to Citizen Kane. So I did watch the movie you know, prior to us meeting with you today. Um, but what I took away from the film now that I'm older and can process it a lot better is that it they had this, this glaring focus on the makings of a narcissist. So this seems so culturally relevant in today's landscape. What are your thoughts on finding empathy for the Charles Keynes of the world? Well, it's much, I, I can say, it's easier for me to say, I don't have empathy for the Charles Keynes of the world, any, but I have empathy for each one that I would learn about, right? Big picture, I, I can't, there's no, there's no space anymore for empathy for that. But in the detail over two hours that we learned about Charles Foster Kane, there's enormous empathy, right? So, you know, um, uh, so you told me in-depth, complicated stories, honest stories, authentic stories about each one of them, you know, I mean, I gotta take a deep breath before saying that. I suspect if I spent, two and a half hours with someone who was both honest and honestly critical about Rupert Murdoch. By the end of it, I might think, well, all right, man, that's a, that's a complicated guy who had his own, you know, uh, uh, who, you know, who had his own, as I always think about hurdles to overcome, right? You know, like when I think about politics, I always think about, you know, X or Y is not going to destroy somebody, but it's a hurdle you got to get past, right? You got to get past it um you know convincing convincing voters convincing supporters that this is something that isn't going to get in your way so I, I i might have some empathy uh and that's what so that's the one of the great legacies of of, of kane is that we're all more complicated than than you think because obviously if you are exposed uh to a boy uh you know losing his sled or, or having that having his innocence taken away and having the sled sort of represent that innocence and you can see why it was taken away right I mean uh, and being you know abandoned by his mother who he loved even if she thought it was the best thing to do for him you know of course if you're not empathetic if that doesn't if that doesn't if that doesn't tug at you a little bit it doesn't give you pause then you're not you're not paying attention and then I don't really want to be friends with 
either. That's sort of, you know, right. Then I'm, then, then we're probably not going to get along, but that said big picture. And I don't know, man, I got, <laughs> I don't think we have space. We got, there are a lot of people deserve our empathy right now. Uh, and I'm not sure, uh, narcissistic media moguls, um, um, you know, it's funny because they, they, I think about it, like succession, which I love, right. The HBO show. And, uh, which I watched again to catch my wife up on it. Like, I don't have any sympathy, any sympathy uh, at all for Brian Cox, but I love it, right? I'm still interested in it, but I have sympathy for his kids, right? Even though they're sort of monstrous, <laughs> right? Each one has a little, but then as it goes on, of course. So, uh, uh, I, you know, I, in a sense, I feel like the, that show's really about like these four little Charles Foster Canes, right? That there's a that, that it seems clear that there's uh, that Kane has informed succession in some way, um, and of course because clearly Murdoch informed succession in some way. But anyway, that's a good question. Did you like it? And it's okay. You can say no. It's hard. You know, you you hear you you you're in film, and then you you hear about Kane, and that it's the greatest movie ever made, and then you're like a grown up, and you see it. And I've had plenty of people. Uh, I went to I saw Kane. At, uh, uh, at at San Simeon, at Hearst Castle, the first screening they had there in the castle of Citizen Kane and uh, Drew Carey was there. And I'd never met Drew Carey before. This was 10 years ago or something. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> afterwards, I mean, Drew Carey knew who I was in the because I, I think he'd been introduced. I don't know if he knew before, but, you know, he knew that's my grandfather. And so afterwards he goes, it was, hey, yes, yeah, first time I saw it. And he was like, so, I mean, come on, best film ever made? that's ridiculous right <laughs> I was like, that's a, um so anyway that's my long way of asking you what you think I, I like the film i mean i did like it and i'm glad that i saw it now so i just have a better understanding i don't think i would have appreciated the film had i saw it like 15 years ago um what i liked about it was i did sort of ruminate and sort of wrestle with the idea that i could see myself empathizing with him somewhat because we saw the origin story and so we saw why he was just this yeah. sort of just became the madman so so seeing that kind of sort of led me to sort of understand people a little bit better it doesn't make him less of a tyrant or a good person but it's just a really interesting conversation because there's a lot of people like that you know at the top so to speak and yeah so I, I and I, I thought about specifically um his relationship with Susan like I was just so bothered by that because her innocence was snatched away from her you know and she just became a different person and she was essentially destroyed so the reason why I, I wanted to know your opinion on the narcissism theme is because when Susan was sort of just at her wits end like this is enough he finally wanted to pour something into her that mattered to her and it's just like this is just such a textbook manipulation and it just then I became angry again, yeah. you know <laughs> Right. No, that's sort of the worst thing he does. Right. I mean, he doesn't he never sees her. He only sees her as what she is to him uh, and never uh, and never who she really is. And she still loved him. Right. Still, despite all that. Great. Thank you, uh, Cami from the Classic Couple. Thanks. So um, let's just say you're the host of this uh, network that shows classic films. All right. And Hypothetical. <laughs> you know, far-fetched, um, and you have the opportunity to interview Herman Mankiewicz about Citizen Kane. What are you gonna ask him? What are your interview questions? No, no, that's a good question. But I mean, I'll, 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 what I would know, what I, I get hung up on is the self-loathing. Like, why don't you think what you do is that? Now, if you're, you know, it, it seems pretty clear, uh, that he saw value in Kane, that he thought he'd written something that mattered. But, you know, which he, this, this idea that what he was doing wasn't worthwhile, you know, clearly came from his, his father, who was the person who came over from Germany, Poland, hard to tell who, who that area belonged to at the time, but uh, came over to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania in the, in the 1880s, and Herman born in 1897. Um, and there was, the, and he was a professor of Franz Mankiewicz, um, uh, and a strict disciplinarian. We have his portrait that, that Joe had for a long time. It's now hanging, um, in our house. Again, we just hung it up this week. It, it, it looks like he's just staring at you and disapprovingly the portrait. It's like, <laughs> follow you. Like, mm, I wouldn't do that now. 
That doesn't seem like, that seems like a waste of your time, don't you think? Um, and both Herman and Joe had this, this struggle that, that they were, uh, you know, uh, that what they were doing wasn't, didn't matter. Wasn't, you know, I mean, if they'd written plays, that would have been good. If they'd written a novel, you know, not a pulp novel, but a novel of substance, uh, that would have mattered. Theater critic, that would have mattered. But uh, writing these silly movies for the masses, right? These popcorn fillers. Uh, the Herman took that and internalized it and thought he'd sort of made his life worthless. You know, they always, politics was all anybody talked about in the, in the family, my father says, growing up, sports, some. But uh, uh, movies were unimportant. And so I, I'm sure I'd ask him questions about whether he still thought that, why he thought that. And that, you know, now, thankfully, you know, in 2021, we, we recognize the art but he never, he, he, that, that just wasn't, he never saw that at all. And that's really, to me, what, you know, the, the tragedy. So, um, you know, but obviously I'd ask him about Wells, what was Wells like, you know, clearly there was a draw. I'm sure he liked him. Herman liked people. I right? loved talking to people and Wells could talk. And I'm sure that that was exciting. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, and, and he had this knack, which Joe had also for understanding women, you know, in, in, in an era where, the, you know, as we got further along into classic Hollywood and there were fewer and fewer female directors, it was hard to be a writer too. Uh, you know, Herman and Joe understood women, clearly paid attention to how they talked at least, maybe not, didn't quite get what they were feeling, but got how they talked. Um, so, you know, that would be interesting sort of, and, and, you know, where do you, and, and, and then how do you manage to sort of reconcile this sort of feeling of that you, this manner in which you loathe authority or resent authority um, and, and, and keep a job in a world where these authority figures are the only people who are going to hire you, right? Nobody's making independent movies during Herman's life. And, you know, he got fired constant fired again and again and again and again because he couldn't keep his mouth shut i mean there's this great story of the you know, that he was it's such a good story can't be true uh, that he was you know uh, hired to write the spanish main and and they had this big end to the spanish main where we'd actually see the ship uh, sunk and then you know that was going to cost i'm making numbers up here that's going to cost forty seven thousand dollars so they thought you know what forget it we're not going to write that we just we'll just talk about it say it say it caught fire and, and sank and her was like that's outrageous you know like well they're just gonna fire you and hire someone else to write the freaking last scene like what what are you doing like what's the point what's your win here um but you know he, he couldn't get out of his own way so i don't know what i'd ask him if i'd actually give it was contemporaneous but but if he'd lived if i'd been able to ask him later then it would be easier for me to come up with questions like if you you finally able to recognize now that what you've done is is worthwhile and why what why do you hate it so much right why why are you so filled with, with self-loathing or what caused that self-loathing we probably end up talking probably be a terribly boring interview where he spent a long time talking about his dad if he was honest but i think he would be and i, I know he'd like my dad always said that, that they would pay they, they were paying me to talk about these movies and Herman would be like, so he just talks about the other people's movies and they pay him? And, and my dad would be like, yeah. And Herman would be like, well, it's fantastic. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. I mean, it's worthless, but well done. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. AJ from Infamous Movies. Hey, Ben, how are you doing today? It's nice to meet you. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, AJ. Oh, cool room. kind of goes that. back to Danielle's question about if it was kind of made today. Uh, we live in this age where Hollywood just keeps recycling ideas from old IPs and just reboots and remakes. Are you kind of surprised that Citizen Kane hasn't been on that list of announced reboots, reimaginings, or remakes yet? in this day and age i'm not surprised because of the other things that haven't been remade right i mean the true classics uh i don't know what that means that's just a thing people say if there is a sort of universally accepted top tier of classic films 
basically, and, and you keep it small. I basically, we're not remaking those, right? I mean, the pressure is too great. The criticism that comes with it ahead of time, uh, too intense. Uh, the expectation then becomes too high. I mean, how do you remake the movie that is, you know, um, you know, considered by so many and so many serious growing up people, the best movie ever made or the second best movie ever made. But I mean, nobody thinks nobody's going to remake Vertigo, which by the way is like Hitchcock's eighth best movie, but whatever, nobody asked me uh, inexplicable that that would be the movie to me. that would. I don't mind a movie replacing Citizen Kane, I don't, but it's Vertigo. Come on. Um, uh, and I know uh, obviously many, including some people listening today will think I'm a moron for thinking that. But I, again, I, I can barely fit Vertigo in Hitchcock's top 10. But I mean, if, you know, but we're not remaking Vertigo, right? I mean, and we're not remaking North by Northwest and we're not remaking Casablanca. Um, we're not remaking Sunset Boulevard. Uh, that would be crazy. Uh, then there's some you could get away with, re, uh, with uh, uh, you know, with, with remaking. Uh, I mean, you know, Rob Marshall was talking about remaking The Thin Man. And, you know, that's different. Right. That's uh, that's more of an idea than that, a, than a truly uh, uh, perfect movie, even though it, it is a perfect movie, but it's not seen quite the same way. So you got to you got to, you know, find the little sweet spot if you're going to remake a classic. Um, but I don't think you can. Uh, uh, there's 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 a handful that you just that I can't imagine somebody giving you forget. First of all, there are no 10 to 15 million. It's so hard to make a movie 10 to 15 million dollars, right? Every movie is either 200 million or 2 million, 1 million, right? Or an independent film. So I, I, I can't see somebody saying, yeah, here's 45 million, 50 million bucks. Go, go remake Citizen Kane. Go remake Castleblank. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't see that happen. But, but uh, uh, so no, I'm not, uh, I'm not surprised. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Jeffrey at the Vegas Film Critic. Ben, Jeff in Vegas, man. Good to see you. Oh, good to see you too. You know, I want to talk about The Sled, which is the holy grail of movie props. You know, four existed, two burned in the film. Spielberg paid for one, 60 grand in 1982. And when Debbie Reynolds opened up her hotel here in Las Vegas, I remember vividly seeing all her collection, saving MGM, all the props, and everything. I saw The Sled on display there in 1995. I had no idea that it was on loan and owned by your grandfather. So what is your experience with the sled in your lifetime? So that sled, I believe the one, because as you said, you said there were four, right? Right. Right. That's the story, right. There were four. And, uh, but the one that was there, if it was the one indeed, then I've heard the same thing that oh, one of my grandfather's long dead. So it was owned by my uncle, Don, my father's brother my grandfather's oldest son and Don had been given at the rap party Ben Hecht gave Herman a sled and Hecht had one had it made I presume by the exactly the same as the ones that had been used in the movie so I don't know whether that's one of the four but it's one of the reasons why when it ultimately sold, it sold for a little bit less money. And his son ultimately sold it at, at auction sometime in the last, my cousin John, in the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. Um, and uh, so the, um, what was the question specifically? What, what's your oh, experience with the sled? On? Yeah, did you, yeah. did you ever so, experience so the sled? Was, or? Yeah, so I well, I never used it to you know sled. In case <laughs> no. That's what the question is. I never, I never went down a mountain on it. Um, in did December, you touch it? Did you see it in but, person? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I did. Yeah, so that one, the only one I ever saw was that one, and that was the story of that sled. Okay, whether that story is fully correct or not, I don't know. But that sled said Rosebud, and there it was, given uh, again, and I'll, to me, that makes it better. Forget that it was the one made by the prop department that wasn't burned. The notion that Ben Hecht gave it to Herman at a party, sort of to celebrate the movie, that's a, to me, a better story. Um, but it ended up not going for the, you know, what you would imagine a Rosebud, so if you had an original Rosebud sled, what that would be worth to somebody now, I can't have seems like somebody would pay certainly hundreds, hundreds, thousands of dollars for that. So, you know, I mean, and my father had the Oscar for years. Um, 
and after my parents divorced, uh, it was in, it was, you know, with him and his uh, place and with his uh, wife, Patricia and in DC. And then he, he put it in a, it was so much to ensure um, that he put it in a safe deposit box. And then he thought, well, it's in a safe deposit box and somebody else in the family needed some money. And my dad who owned it completely, but he sold the sled at auction. He sold the Oscar at auction so he could give some of the money to somebody who needed money. My dad was very generous and would always, he didn't care about money and he would always help people, which Herman is true. Herman too, was always borrowing money and lending it simultaneously. And in fact, that's, that's part of, you see a little bit of that in Mank and Fincher's movie. So uh, uh, I wish obviously that we still had the Oscar because I definitely, I'd have it now. I mean, my brother and I would, I'm sure co-own it, but I'd keep it. Um, and, uh, uh, but I get it, but I love that my dad sold it because it was too much to insure and he had to put it in a safe deposit box. So what's the point? <laughs> and he would always think, mm. but his hope was that Spielberg would buy it because Spielberg bought the, Anna, bought the Herman's copy of the screenplay with Herman's notes on it. Um, and, uh, and so the theory was, well, sell the Oscar and her and Spielberg will buy that too. And that's like giving it to a museum. Right. Um, and, uh, but so we don't know who bought it. We don't know about the Oscar, and it didn't go for as much money as anybody <laughs> had hoped. Whereas now, of course, it would, I can't imagine that Herman's Oscar for Citizen Kane, and you know, because it's one of the last Oscars you could sell. But obviously, I wish it was still in the family. But the sled, yeah, I saw and I touched, but um, um, but you know, it's a, uh, and I of course I wish we had it, but I, I don't know, man. It's a slippery slope of memorabilia, and uh, I'm overwhelmed with the number of things that we have, none of which is worth any money, but all these letters. I have great letters that Ben Heck wrote to people like Ben Heck wrote to, to my grandfather after my grandfather died, who wrote to my grandmother after my grandfather died. And, you know, it's a, I love having that stuff, but I, I don't know why, you know, it feels like it would be okay not to have that. I should probably give it to somebody, probably give it to the Academy Museum, see if they can do anything with it. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. We have time for one more question. So I'll send that to Jim at Real Talker. Hey Ben, good to connect with you again. You know, yeah. we've, you've kind of mentioned uh, during this whole discussion, a lot of we've been talking about your family kind of lineage. Have you ever dug deeper into the sort of maybe Polish or German, as you mentioned, family lineage? Is, is that something that interests you to, to kind of go back and maybe, um, you know, get to know your ancestry or kind of the background of the Minkowitz uh, last name and where it comes from. I haven't heard you talk about it. Maybe you have, but I, I just been kind of curious about that since, you know, you have such a esteemed family and and uh, kind of the origins of it dating back. Um, is that something you're interesting, interested in exploring further, you know, delving into? Well, my sense, first of all, you know, my, my cousin's book, uh, Competing with Idiots, Nick Davis is out uh, tomorrow, um, from Knopf. Um, it's this, a book about Herman and Joe and their relationship. The second book in two years about Herman and Joe and, uh, Nick's is great. And Nick, Nick also, by the way, his documentary on the 1986 Mets on ESPN also out tomorrow. It's a big week for my cousin, mm -hmm. Nick, uh, my cousin, Nick. And, uh, so I just, <laughs> I mean, I feel like the world, to the extent that it ever cared, probably heard enough from the Mank. It's like we got two books on the brothers and Mank the movie and enough. But yes, the answer is I am interested. Have I delved too deeply into it? No. My father was his master storyteller, you know, um, you know, grew up. So, he, so growing up, you know, got told, look, your name matters. And you know, it doesn't mean you're entitled. You, you, you don't, it means you, you should sort of be on your best behavior, in fact, because the name matters to people. So don't, don't act like an idiot, right? Don't be cruel to people. Uh, 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 be thoughtful, be uh, smart, uh, mostly be empathetic. Um, but but your name matters. And, 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 and if you ever meet another Mankiewicz or read about another Mankiewicz, he's related to you. He just is, right? There aren't. It turns out, no, that's, it's just not true, right? I mean, I remember listening to a uh, to, uh, sports talk radio and hearing uh, this guy, Matt Mankiewicz, you know, you know, uh, let's go to the Giants stadium. Matt Mankiewicz has the latest on the Giants Eagles, you know. Uh, well, uh, you know, that 27-10 Giant lead now 
Uh, you know, Randall Cunningham thrown two touchdown passes here in the early fourth quarter. Matt Magle was live at Giant Stadium uh, back here. But no, and they're all over the place. So that was nonsense. And then later, my dad tells me that, well, you know, nobody back in the old country, nobody really had a name. You didn't have a last name. You were Herman the Cobbler, you know, or, you know, you were you were Frank the Shoemaker. And then the, the people would just take the last name of the most successful family. And the family up on the hill was called Mankiewicz. So before they came, they would have taken the name Mankiewicz. And I was like, I, I swear to God, I was like 31 when I heard the story. And I was like, <laughs> what? You know, and he was like, yeah, I've told you that. I'm like, no, you haven't told me that. So we just picked it because there were that the successful family on the hill was named Mankiewicz. You know, and there's a Mankiewicz paint company in Germany, very successful Mankiewicz paint company. Uh, been around for decades and decades, maybe a hundred years. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that made me more interested in it because it's it's obviously, <laughs> we're not the only Mankiewicz. This is a bunch in Boston. There's a bunch in Philadelphia. Um, so I, I'm curious. I don't know whether we're, and maybe we are distantly related to those people. I don't know. Or maybe again, they just also took the name of the most successful family. Because of course, if you took the name of the successful family and it was up on a hill, then other people are looking at the hill from another angle and they may have taken the same name too. So I'm I'm now dubious of all stories about the origin of the name or who we're related to. Um, but uh, I am and always have been uh, uh, you know, deeply, deeply proud to be a Mankiewicz. And I, I would like to know more. And I, I suppose that would be a I just can't imagine anybody cares, but uh, I suppose I'd like to find out. And uh, that would be a fun part of a book uh, to write. Yeah, maybe a trip to like Poland and Germany, too. That'd be kind of cool, too, to document well, that. Totally. I'm a World War II buff, so that's a trip I've always wanted to make, a trip that was going to get made before the pandemic. So, uh, hmm. yeah, that's uh, yeah, I could I suppose I could uh, that would be a valuable, uh, valuable to turn it into that, too. But anyway, thanks for asking. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for answering. Sure.